Alright. Hey, my name is Ian Finlayson, and I'm going to be presenting some ongoing research I'm doing on static pipelining. Uh, the motivation for this work is to build more energy efficient embedded processors. Uh, nowadays, with things like Android and iPhone, uh, we're having more and more performance requirements for our embedded systems because they're being given more and more complicated, sophisticated applications. But we still uh, want to have low energy consumption and low power because these devices are being powered off of the battery and the longer the battery lasts, the more happy the consumer is. Also, uh, another change that's been taking place is that embedded systems now often, uh, more often are programmable. Instead of just being a fixed unit that comes with whatever software the distributor put on it, they're a platform for developers to write mobile applications so that you can add more functionality to your device. So uh, the introduction of programmability and the need to have a very good performance for power uh, ratio kind of um, precludes using uh, ASICs or application specific circuits because those aren't programmable. So uh, that's our goal. One uh, very common technique to increase uh, performance of processors is instruction pipelining. The basic idea behind pipelining is that you split the execution of instructions into different stages so that your processor's clock rate can run at the speed it takes to do only one stage of execution rather than to do the whole thing from start to finish. But unfortunately, this is kind of a trade-off between performance versus power consumption because pipelining is kind of inefficient with regards to energy consumption. For example, uh, to keep track of the state while you're breaking the instruction into stages, you have these large pipeline registers between each stage. And every single cycle, you have to read and write all of these registers, which is expensive. We also have the introduction of forwarding and hazard logic because in a pipeline, we have these data hazards because uh, in instruction that's calculating a value might uh, not be finished calculating by the time we need it for the next instruction. So we have this forwarding logic to copy things back from later stages to earlier stages, which is expensive to do in hardware. We also have this hazard detection up here to check when we can or cannot even issue an instruction. Uh, another inefficiency of pipelining is that the data hazards also lead to unnecessary register accesses because um, oftentimes we'll read a register from the register file even though we're never going to use that value because we're going to get the value from the forwarding network instead. And we did some experiments with uh, my bench on simple scalar and found that about 28% of register reads were not used because of this. Likewise, we can have unnecessary register writes because if we're writing a value back to the register file, but the only instruction that ever cared about that value in the first place already got it from forwarding, then that write is not necessary. And likewise, I found about 11% of register writes uh, were not needed because of that. So we'd like to have a way to get the performance benefit of pipelining, namely being able to increase your clock rate without having some of these unnecessary inefficiencies in your hardware. So our design is to move the pipelining decisions from being done dynamically in the hardware to being done statically in the compiler. So this figure here represents the uh, main idea of static pipelining. Over here we have a sequence of traditional instructions. And here we have the way they're implemented with traditional pipelining. So for a load instruction, uh, this gray box represents what one instruction uh, specifies to the hardware. So the load instruction is specified all at once, and it stays in the uh, microarchitecture for multiple cycles, and it's, the microarchitecture is responsible for breaking it down. Now with static pipelining, we still have instructions take multiple cycles to execute, but what we specify at once is only what the hardware needs to be aware of at that particular cycle. So for this example, we specify that we need to read the registers of the subtract instruction, execute the load instruction, and uh, well, add doesn't do a, a memory stage, but if it did, that would be there. And then write back the registers for a store instruction. So uh, the pipelining is done statically by the compiler instead. And uh, 
this uh, leads to increased compiler control because it doesn't have to do things that aren't necessary because it can see that they're going to be done. And also simpler hardware because we don't have to worry about those things like forwarding or hazards or pipeline registers I talked about earlier. So this is what a statically pipeline microarchitecture would look like. Uh, pretty much the first part of the pipeline is the fetch stage, and that's unchanged from the original uh, RISC-like architecture. The difference is the rest of the pipeline, uh, everything here executes at once in parallel, so we can still have the high clock rate that we got from uh, pipelining in general because we don't have to wait for everything to happen sequentially. A big difference in the static pipeline is that we've replaced the pipeline registers with these 10 named internal registers. And these, unlike the pipeline registers, are architecturally visible, so the compiler can see them and can move data in and out between them. Also, unlike the pipeline registers, they don't have to be read and written every cycle. They can withhold values throughout several cycles. And uh, I'll go over what each one mean real quick. The LV, or load value, is for loading things from the data cache. RS1, register source 1, register source 2, are for loading values from the register file. Uh, the sign extend register is for uh, specifying, or for holding a constant that's specified in the instruction. ALUR and FPUR are for results that come from the ALU and FPU, respectively. The target address register holds calculated branch targets. And the sequential address register holds the next sequential PC plus one value. So at any time, you can say save the address of the next instruction, and it'll be saved into that register. And we'll see why that's useful later. And these copy one and copy two registers are used to hold a copy of any of the other registers. So uh, also, uh, another thing to be aware of is that because these registers only hold one value and are placed next to where they're going to be used, they can be accessed more cheaply than a register in the register file for, for less energy cost. And here's a quick example of how an instruction will be statically pipelined through this microarchitecture. Uh, we're going to look at a load instruction, and this box down here is the instruction that we fetched and that the, mic and that the pipeline is now having to execute. So here, uh, the red part is the part that corresponds to the load instruction that we're tracing through, and there's going to be other things that pop up, but they're, they happen in parallel. So, uh, First, we specify that we have to read the registers for the load, which is the base address register being read into this register, and then the offset to form the effective address is read into the sign extent register. Next, we add those two together to calculate the memory address and store it into the ALUR register. Then we perform the load and read that value into the load value register. And then finally, write it back to the register file. So things are still being pipelined through the microarchitecture. It's just being done statically. So some benefits of this, I mentioned there's no pipeline registers, which are expensive because they're quite large. Uh, we can avoid unnecessary register file accesses. And we have simpler hardware because we don't need to do the things like forwarding I talked about. And we also have increased compiler control. The challenges that we have introduced are that code size is going to be a little bit trickier because, as you see in these instructions, we're specifying a lot more at once than a traditional risk instruction would. And also, because we've kind of offset some work from the microarchitecture to the compiler, building the compiler is going to be a little bit more challenging. So that's what I'll talk about next. Uh, the overview of our compiler, we start with C code, of course, and read that into the compiler front end and produce intermediate code, just like any other compiler, pretty much. But instead of immediately compiling that code for the static pipeline, we first compile it for a MIPS architecture. And the reason we do this is that we found that some optimizations, like uh, register allocation, are a lot more challenging to do for the static pipeline than for a RISC architecture. So we generate the MIPS uh, RTLs, which is the intermediate format our compiler uses. And then the problem here is that these MIPS RTLs do things that can't be done in one instruction on a static pipeline, such as reading 
regi two registers by adding them together, then storing them back to the register file. So we have to break those up into uh, individual pipeline effects. And that's done by the effect expander here. And then those RTLs are finally compiled and optimized for a statically pipeline assembly language. Uh, in the statically pipeline here, those internal registers, as I mentioned before, are visible to the compiler so that it can uh, perform optimizations on them. Yeah. Okay. So here's an example just to run through how the compiler basically works. And I've kind of reduced the size of this for time. But uh, here's our source code. We basically, in this example, just add some constant to every element of an array. And as I said, the first step is to compile it for MIPS. So that's what we do here and get these five assembly language instructions that perform that computation. And then the next step is to expand those into the individual pipeline effects. So that's what we've done here. For uh, this instruction, you can see the original MIPS was to load two registers, add them together, and put them in another register. Well, first we read the first register into our register source, then read the second register, then add those two together, and then store that result back into the register file. So, uh, of course, if this was all we did, then we would have made the code a lot worse because it's around four times more instructions to do the same thing. But uh, it's kind of interesting to notice that this is what really, really will happen on a traditional RISC architecture, except that instead of using these internal registers, it will use portions of the pipeline register. So when you read these two registers, they're going to be read into some pipeline register between the decode and execute stage. And then they're going to be read in from there and put into add together in the ALU. Then put into a slot in the uh, pipeline register between uh, execute and write back. So from an energy standpoint, this is kind of what's really happening. So it's our baseline. And we're going to optimize these to try and get the performance back to where it was. So I uh, went through this quickly, but we performed copy propagation, dead assignment elimination, and common sub-expression elimination to optimize the statically pipeline instructions. And this was the code we got. Oh, we also performed loop invariant code motion, but some of that was done by hand, whereas the rest of it was done automatically. And this was the code we got. So uh, as you can see, we got seven instructions, which is not quite as good as the MIPS 5, but uh, it's a lot closer. And um, also notice that some of the optimizations we've done couldn't have been done on a traditional RISC machine. For example, some of these things that we pulled out, like reading a register or sign extending an immediate value, they cannot be pulled out of the MIPS instructions or pretty much any architecture because that's, you know, that the only instructions they have are to reference them directly. So. The next step is uh, to schedule multiple of these effects to happen at once, because that's the whole idea of pipeline, is that several things can be going on simultaneously. So we did that by hand as well, and we came up with this final schedule of the code, which has, as you can see, only three instructions in the main loop body. And we also software pipeline this loop uh, which is why we have more instructions before and after. But in this example, we were still able to improve performance over the baseline. So what I'm looking at now is yeah. every one of the, like for the example, you had three instructions in the pipe. This is performing that behavior for all of them at that slice of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, so for this first instruction in the loop, it's going to be doing these things simultaneously at the same time in parallel. So. Uh, that's how we're able to get our performance. Okay, so we did a, uh, a preliminary evaluation of this architecture. And we ported the BPO compiler to the static pipeline, which is what I've been talking about. And we also ported the GNU assembler and built a simulator based on the simple scalar suite. And for benchmarks we used, because uh, part of the optimizations we're doing are still by hand, we couldn't do very large or very many benchmarks. So we did the vector add, which was the running example I had where you just add a constant to the array, and also the convolution benchmark from DSP Stone, which is also a very short program. And when we ran them 
compile them and optimize them uh, through our simulator, these were the results we got. We were able to reduce the number of dynamic instructions by around 40%, so we improved performance by a fair amount. And what we're really looking forward here for here is to improve the energy efficiency. And the way I estimated that for now was to count the number of register and uh, internal register reads and writes. So for the register file, we reduced the reads by 84 and 90 percent, and reduced the register file writes by 50 or 66 percent. And the main way that we got the savings was by accessing the smaller internal registers instead of going to the register file. We kind of like sort of cached those values instead of having to read them and write them over and over again. Now this, these other two columns are internal reads and writes, and those are different for the two architectures we're comparing. For the MIPS, they're the large pipeline registers between each stage, and these are, uh, there's four of them in a five-stage pipeline and we read and write them every single cycle. So we have a very high number for those. And uh, for the static pipeline, we are counting the number of internal register reads and writes. And of course, these don't have to be accessed unless the compiler says that they should be accessed for a given cycle. So we were able to decrease the number of reads and number of writes for both of those fairly substantially as well. And uh, this is uh, kind of a low estimate because also keep in mind that the pipeline registers are going to be quite a bit larger than the internal registers. Um, Ian, yeah. <clears throat> uh, just a note, unless you're indexing to a register file uh, where you have a choice of registers and you want to choose one of them, register reads are free, because they're always dumping the data. Think of it like that. They're always out there. Oh, I see. So copying, the, writing the, you know, writing the, 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 the data somewhere is going to cost energy but it's always kind of being projected, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but writing it will take energy. Yeah. yeah right. Because what happens is when you write the register, mm -hmm. um, the output to it switches. Right, right. right. Yeah. So it's the switching the is more cost energy. Yeah, it's but reading it doesn't imply any switching. Right. Sure. Okay. All right, well those were the results we got. So uh, in conclusion, we were able to, or at least in these examples, achieve the high performance that instruction pipelining gives you because we are able to not have to do any more work in sequentially, but also decrease the number of instructions. And we have simpler hardware because we don't have to do these pipeline register reads and writes and forwarding and hazard detection. We've also decreased the number of register accesses and opened up a new level of compiler optimizations because these individual registers are now visible to the compiler and it can optimize the transfers between them. For future work, uh, we have to implement scheduling, which uh, along with some other optimizations will allow us to compile everything automatically so that we can do larger and more benchmarks. And uh, we're also going to look at reducing code size, because right now we're using a 64-bit wide instruction format, which is, of course, too wide for any embedded system. And we also want to evaluate the energy consumption in more detail. So instead of just saying, well, we saved register accesses, say, well, how much energy did we really save, as Pete brought up. So any questions? All right, let's give our presenter a round of applause.